Yeah, hi, my name is Carl. Uh, I'm a product designer. Actually, my discipline is product design, but uh, the content web is something that I've been fascinated with like since I, since I got into web design and um, the topic for today as well is something which I am very, very passionate about. So, so I'm assuming you can see my screen uh, and you can hear me loud and clear. Um, so welcome everyone. Welcome again to this session on uh, web typography. Um, so I have a lot to kind of cover today. Um, and I have kind of, uh, you know, going to really limit myself to 25 minutes. I really don't want to, you know, stretch it beyond that. So, uh, there's a lot of stuff, as you can see that, that I'll try to cover, but I really, uh, I really want to spend time mostly on sections three and four, uh, which is, I think the reason why, you know, most of you have joined today. Um, so we'll be talking about typeface selection, uh, and also the whole issue of uh, licensing and deploying fonts right, on the web, which, I, which is something I think we don't really speak about uh, too much. Um, so let's spend more time on those two sections. I'm going to kind of breeze through the first two. Uh, but I think uh, you know, it's kind of important that we talk about them because uh, in a topic like this, it's always good to start with why. Uh, so you know, why the fuss about fonts and why this session? Uh, what is so special about typography on the web? Um, many of you have, may have probably read this seminal article from Oliver Reichenstein. It was written many years ago in which he says, uh, you know, 95% of uh, the information on the internet is written language. 95%, right? Um, so the article was kind of written many years ago. Um, so you could, you, you could probably say that, well, we have, you know, Flickr and we have Instagram and YouTube, right? Uh, so does this still hold water? You know, is, is it still 95%? I would kind of agree and say, yes, maybe not 95%, maybe lesser, but definitely in the context of the content web, which is the space that we are talking about here, right? So the content web is uh, e-commerce sites and, and, and content heavy websites, marketing sites, you know, blogs, news sites. Within this particular space, I think definitely 95% of it, of, of design is typography. And if you look at the actual, you know, the purpose of typography, you know, he says in the same article, Oliver writes, uh, we have one duty as designers, and that is to convey what the site is trying to say, like convey information in writing. And if you're not doing that, you know, with your fancy fonts or whatever you, you know, you plan to do, uh, you know, your site or, you know, your, your, your blog is without purpose, right? So we just have one duty. Um, and the second thing I would say is that since uh, you know, 95% of the web is uh, typography. Um, then we need to take it a bit more seriously, right? And and a lot of brands, I think, almost all the brands today, the big ones, have have kind of understood that typography is in a, in essence a, a core extension of your brand's visual identity, right? Uh, I mean, if you think about it, there are just so few vectors on which uh, you know you can differentiate your brand from another brand. You know, you have uh, color, you have typography, uh, you, know, you have, you have uh, to some extent, you have white space and layout and margins and padding and that, and that sort of stuff. And maybe I would say also like, you know, your aesthetic, uh, you know, your aesthetic flourishes, like your style of illustration or, you know, the way that you treat uh, photography and stuff like that, but just a handful of vectors and typography is one of the most important ones. Uh, so the big tech companies uh, realized this, I think many years ago, Google in 2015, uh, announced that they were uh, working on their own typeface family, internal one. They, it started off as Roboto, I think. Now it's, they call it Products now. It's used everywhere, all across you know, their whole ecosystem. Same with Apple. Apple started with um, San Francisco, and now they have New York, which is their serif display face. Again, used all over the place. And it was just a matter of time before you know, all the other guys jumped in, right? Netflix and Airbnb and all the rest. Um, and uh, Netflix uses Netflix Sound, which is their own custom face, uh, you know, everywhere from the billboards in Times Square, you know, to, uh, you know, your consoles that you actually watch uh, Netflix on at home. Same with Airbnb. Um, I don't know how many of you remember this particular one. Hamsa, maybe you do. This was uh, a, a microsite called Lost World Fairs, again from 2010. Uh, so the story here is that Typekit at that time was one of the leading you know, players for typography, they commissioned this website as their way of saying like, you know, look, we have these hundreds and, and thousands of typefaces, you know, see what we can do with it. And I think they commissioned Jason Santa Maria for this particular page. 
but essentially, you know, they were saying 10 years ago, you know, this is what we could do. This is like literally 10 years old. And if you look at the site, all of that text there is actually selectable, which was a big deal, you know, given 10 years ago, the kind of spotty support that we had for web fonts in terms of browsers. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that imagine if we could do this, you know, 10 years ago with web fonts, imagine like the possibilities we have today, the possibilities open to any brand. Um, but it, it wasn't always like that. Uh, the kind of uh, widespread adoption that we have today, it wasn't always the case. It was very different some time back. And I'm really kind of, you know, going to breeze through this part because, uh, you know, all the designers, you know, starting with web design today, you guys don't have to really bother about any of this stuff because today you just use font face and everything just works. But anyone remembers the time of web safe font stacks. It was absurd to, to think about this, you know, I can only use the fonts that ship with my OS. Oh my God. You know, so if, you, if, you, if you're on Windows, you had Georgia, you had Times New Roman and, you know, a few others, Arial. If you were on Mac OS, you had, you know, Helvetica and, and, and just a few others, nothing else. That's all you could use. Um, but then, you know, being designers, we, we started kind of, you know, getting antsy about it. And we said, what else can we do? And someone said, let's use images, right? So we started image replacement. Um, so that was a thing for some time, but then, you know, with that, uh, we quick, quickly realized again that uh, updating the site is, is so tedious. I need to go back into Photoshop, you know, uh, typeset the text there, create a slice, update my server. It is a real pain. So how could we automate that? Someone said, let's use Flash, uh, uh, which kind of solved it to some extent, uh, but now it brought in a lot more problems because now you needed both Flash and JavaScript, right? As if JavaScript was not enough, now you needed flash too uh, and obviously it had you know adverse effects on performance um, and i think the main reason this particular method didn't take off was because uh, the foundries and the designers could never sort out the licensing issue so you know people was uh, sharing these swf files all over the place they were just being freely downloaded and and everyone was just like totally misusing it so this never really took off um, so all these methods i'm sharing uh, you know i've actually used at some point of time uh, I'm sure Sovik and others also have used them. Hamsa, maybe you have too. Um, this was, I think, the last one before we got to web fonts. This was like people saying, you know, let's chuck the flash, uh, just use JavaScript. Um, and so we had these font maps. So if you look at this here, you have something called, you know, a font map. So people used to take fonts, generate, you know, font maps out of them as JavaScript objects, and then render that on a canvas element. Uh, so again, a lot of complex processing. You couldn't use it for a lot of text. Uh, and the licensing was still kind of a bit, you know, sketchy. So long story short, it has taken us as an industry 10 long years um, to transition from what we started off with, web safe fonts, to where we are today, web fonts. 10 long years. Um, and today, it's just this. Literally anyone, you know, any designer can just go to something like a Google fonts, uh, you know, copy paste that code from there, you know, just make a font family declaration in your CSS, you know, font family X, Y, Z, and it just works, right? It's selectable, it's copyable. You don't need JavaScript anymore. It's, it, you know, it's fully accessible. Uh, and we kind of have, uh, you know, consensus in terms of licensing. Uh, you know, the foundries and, and stuff have got, you know, have got licensing covered now. Uh, so this is the way forward, right? So we'll talk about licensing in the last uh, section. In terms of formats, um, we have many that we used to use before. So if you remember font face declarations, like even from four or five years ago, we had to actually serve all of these four different variants, depending on what, you know, uh, devices our users had. Uh, so OTF and TTF are like the desktop versions, the desktop font formats. Uh, you know, Internet Explorer being Internet Explorer, they said, no, we need our own format. So that's EOT for you. Um, then you had SVG, which was for mobile users. So uh, I'm not going to, you know, get into details with all of this again. Uh, if at all, you know, any of you are interested, we could maybe cover this during Q and A. Um, but today, you know, it's safe to say that we have a web open font format, um, and that's the that's the path forward. The W3C and the other kind of governing bodies have more or less agreed that this is what everyone should use, and the browser support is very very good for these two as well. So today, you just basically need to use you know one of these two. So um, now that we've kind of got a little context about uh, you know, what these fonts are, and we have these hundreds and thousands of fonts available at our disposal, 
right? So how do we actually go about using them? How do we select them? You know, how do we go about with uh, typesetting? Um, there have been books written about this subject, uh, and I really don't want to, you know, get into details here. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it like broad at a high level uh, and keep it to the context of the content web, right? Uh, so I'd say from my experience, keep it simple and just start off with a body face and a display face, right? Keep it simple, body face, display face. Um, so what is a body face and a display face, you might ask? Um, so it's kind of simple. So these are some examples of body faces, right? So what are body faces? Any typeface which is meant to be used, it's designed in such a way that it works really well at small sizes, is a body face. Okay, how small? 18 pixels and lower, 20 pixels and lower, right, for, for the internet. Something of something in that range, 80 to 20. Anything below that is a body face. Um, so here you have three of my favorites, you know, uh, from different foundries. Um, so you might you might ask, you know, what makes uh, what make these good body faces? They have certain characteristics that you can look out for. Again, um, I don't want to, you know, I can geek about this for like an hour, but uh, I have to restrain myself in the interest of time. Um, but a few things to look out for when you're when you're trying to identify a body face. Uh, the first thing you can see is here you can see the lowercase a. So there's something called x height. How tall are your lowercase letters compared to your ascenders? So L is an ascender. It has an ascender here. So here you can see the A is over 50% as tall as you know the L. So that means it has a large x height. Any typeface that has a large x height is good, uh, you know, at small sizes. That means if you make uh, you know, this particular font at 14 pixels or 16 pixels, uh, it's going to be legible, it's going to be readable. Uh, you have something called apertures. If you can see here, uh, there is a wide gap between the, you know, between the endings of the E, which means again, if you make the E very small, it will be discernible as an E and it's not like some other alphabet. Uh, so that's an example of wide apertures. You have something called counters. Uh, if they're small, you know, it's not readable at small sizes. You need something like this, a large O, you know, very round, almost geometric kind of O, uh, which works well at small sizes. And then here I've just taken Kohinoor uh, as an example of uh, a non-Latin face. This is a Devanagari face. Uh, there is something called stroke contrast, okay? Uh, does the, the, the thickness of the stroke vary as you go over the letter, right? So as you see here, it's kind of very, very uniform. So this is an example of an unmodulated face. There is no kind of difference in thickness. So any, any face with low contrast works well at small sizes. You'll see what some of these things mean when I show you display faces and how different they are. So keep in mind all the things that I just said and kind of compare it with this. You saw Elena from process type, uh, you know, large X height and low contrast. This is an example of high contrast. So this is play fair display. I mean, the name itself says it, it's, it's a display face. So if you look at the E here, the horizontal bar on the E is razor thin, you know, compared to the rest here, it's like super thick, right? If you look at um, the horizontal bar on the F, compare that with how meaty and how kind of, you know, almost like a bulb the serif is, you know, uh, same for all the, uh, all the rest of the, of the alphabets. There is like such a contrast between certain strokes. So imagine if you if you if you typeset a whole paragraph of this at 14 pixels or 16 pixels using Playfair display, you'll almost kind of see waves on your paragraph, you know, because it's like thick stroke, thin stroke, thick stroke, thin stroke. You know, you can almost see like waves, uh, and it's kind of very distracting, right? And it doesn't really read well. Uh, so you know, any typeface with uh, you know high stroke contrast is not a good choice for small sizes. It's only to be used at large sizes, like 48 pixels, 64 pixels, you know, large sizes. And that's what all these are. These are all display faces. They are meant to be used only at large sizes. Similarly for the E, look at this gap here. It's super thin. You know, if you compare it to this E from Pisa and look at the E from Avangard. If you make this E like 14 pixels, it will look like an O with a, with a dash through it. You know, it won't even look like an E. Uh, similarly here, you know, at small sizes, this, this will read upper instead of copper because again, the C, the aperture of the C will almost kind of touch at like 14 pixels, 12 pixels. Um, and of course it goes without saying, um, no like brush script or display face of this nature should ever be used for body text. It's only meant to be used uh, at display sizes. So the moment you see like any sort of decorative typeface, 
like a, like a script face or a brush face or a black letter type face. It's, you know, it, you only use that at large sizes, never at small sizes. So you don't have to uh, remember all of this stuff. You know, you don't have to be a type geek to understand and apply all of these things. You don't have to remember, oh, what is an aperture? You know, what is stroke width? Uh, if you're confused about a particular face, you can, uh, you know, most likely head to the website. So if you're, if you're taking something from Google fonts, just head over to Google fonts, you know, and, and, and read a bit about the typeface. Uh, the foundry and the designer or the designer will always have a, a, at least a small description talking about what is the intended usage of this face, right? They will, they will most, majority of the times they state it very clearly, okay? So if you look at some of these here, so these are just random typefaces I took from uh, my fonts. So if you look at Atelas, it says humanist, open counters. Uh, Kohinoor says low contrast. So when you, when you read uh, terms like that, you know, humanist, open counters, low contrast, you know at once it's a body face. That means it works well at small sizes, right? Uh, but in some other cases, uh, the designer or the foundry may explicitly say display face, right? So Gilroy, it, it explicitly says suited for graphic design and any display use. Uh, very rarely, you have typefaces that work well at, at, at large sizes and at small sizes. So Signo is one in which they say, uh, you know, charismatic typeface or headlines, but it also has an X height and open counters, right? So this is kind of like an exception. Uh, but I mean, we can talk about this, uh, you know, in detail probably later. Uh, but most of the times, majority of the times, it will be very clear what it's used for. I'm going to move on to the next bit. Um, so display versus body is like the basic question that you can start off with, but there are other things that you can consider when you are selecting your typefaces, right? Uh, starting with the nature of your site content itself, right? Um, let's say you're designing a site for something like the New York Times, okay? Where in which your content is authoritative, right? They have a reputation as being authoritative. They present facts uh, and, and it's a new site. So, you know, it, it is concerned with things that happened in the past. And these three attributes are closely associated with serif faces, which is why you see, uh, you know, the New York Times uses mostly serif faces on their website. Uh, contrast that with something like Daring Fireball. So this is one of the leading tech blogs. Uh, you know, they focus mostly around Apple News, one of the leading uh, tech blogs. So it is run by one person, uh, John Grubber. So his writing style is a lot more informal. You know, it's, uh, it's a lot more opinion pieces. Uh, and that's the subject matter itself is modern, right? It's, it's Apple, it's tech stuff, uh, which makes a sans serif a better you know, choice for a site like that, right? So you have like two different sites, uh, you know, using two different types of typefaces depending on the subject matter. Other considerations. Do I just need Latin characters or do I need something else? Do I need Devanagari? Do I need Arabic characters? So a lot of times that might determine what typeface you end up choosing. Right. So even if you're if you're using something free, like like from Google fonts, right, it, it still affects your decision. Uh, weights and variance is another thing. Right. Uh, you'll be surprised to see how many free fonts actually ship with only like one bold face or maybe one italic face. Right. Which is OK for like, you know, if you're using it for something casual. But if you're if you're doing something like editorial work or you're really you know you really need like a full range of weights like you need a hairline and a extra thin you know or a, or a semi bold or a black and an ultra and those kind of weights uh, you, you're better off you know looking for a paid typeface is what I would say right so availability of weights and variants also sometimes you know makes uh, is something to consider and of course if you need fancy stuff like authentic small caps or you need you know swash uh, uh, swashes, right? Or you need ligatures, you know, authentic ligatures. So all these are open type features, which again, uh, a lot of fonts, you'll be surprised that a lot of fonts don't actually have these, a lot of web fonts, okay? Uh, the desktop variants may have them, but you know, the web fonts, they might just strip it out from the web fonts. Uh, other, other small nuances to consider, okay? So these are like super, you know, nuanced, but worth mentioning. Uh, if you're designing a site for a particular philosophy or a cause, okay? So out of curiosity, I just went to Black Lives Matter, you know, some weeks back, just curious to see what typeface they use and who designed it. Uh, so spoiler alert, it is not a, a black designer. It's, it's a white dude. Uh, but I'm, I'm just saying that if I designed, uh, you know, a website for something like this, uh, you know, the least I would do is at least research 
you know, uh, Thai faced designers or Thai foundries, you know, uh, started by, you know, black designers. And Darden Studio is, is a very famous example. They've, they've created typefaces used by, you know, uh, I think President Obama in his campaigns. So, you know, I'd maybe use something like that, at least. Uh, if you're creating a website, like maybe uh, uh, talking about like uh, feminine poets, you know, or, or, or something of that sort, at least select, uh, you know, a, a typeface designed by a woman, right? Uh, if you're creating something solely for an Indian audience, Right. At least consider using a typeface designed by an Indian designer or at least by an Indian foundry. And uh, I think ITF is doing an excellent job here. So ITF is, I think, based out of Ahmedabad, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But they have like a big collection of very, very high quality typefaces in Devnagri, Tamil, Malayalam, all of these, you know, Indian uh, scripts. And uh, of course, the last nuance that you might want to consider is, of course, cost and the licensing model. Um, so, I mean, I totally understand this is not a technically a nuance. Sometimes cost trumps all the other factors, right? Especially if you're working on a site for a client and, you know, they really don't have the budget to pay for fonts. Then this, this kind of uh, consideration may trump all the others. Uh, but I think it's a nice segue to the last, you know, section of what I wanted to talk about, which is licensing and deploying web fonts. Um, so how do you actually go about with this? So given the whole history of uh, web fonts and the long path that we've taken that I just talked about. So today we've kind of arrived at two camps with respect to licensing and deploying. So on the one hand, you have uh, the self-hosted model, uh, which is basically the foundry saying, you know, here you go, here are your fonts. Uh, you know, uh, you, you have to deploy them yourself, right? We just give you the fonts. Uh, and on the other side, you have the managed model, uh, which is the Google fonts and the Adobe fonts. Uh, which basically they handle the whole, you know, licensing aspect of it and the deployment. So both are handled, you know, in a managed model. So I'll, I'll talk about this in, in a bit detail, uh, a bit later. Um, but I kind of just want to show you where you, you could go about, you know, getting some of these from. So in the first bucket, like the self-hosted, uh, you know, bucket, uh, if you're looking for fonts to buy and host yourself, uh, you can just head out directly to the Foundry website, right? Most of the good foundries today sell websites on their own stores. Uh, sorry, sell fonts on their own on their own stores. So if you look at like Claim Type Foundry or Type Together, you know ITF, Dalton Mark, all of them have their own stores. You can just go there and and purchase the web fonts directly from them. Or you could go to marketplaces like My Fonts, or Font Shop, or Fonts.com. So here you have uh, typefaces. Uh, you know, retail faces uh, from hundreds of foundries in one place. So it, they make it a lot more convenient for you. But in either case, you still have to deploy them yourself. Okay, they, they just give you the fonts. If you contrast that with the managed model that I was, that I just was talking about earlier. So here you essentially pay a recurring cost. Uh, and that cost covers both the licensing aspect of it and the hosting aspect of it. Okay, so something like Google Fonts, which is free, but you know, some of these other ones are, are paid. So Adobe Fonts uh, is the one that I personally use for my own sites and all my hobby projects. Uh, Type Tutor is one I uh, discovered very recently. Uh, Heffler has, you know, cloud, cloud typography, and then there are a few others. Um, so in, in either way, uh, whether you go with the self-hosted, you know, model or you go with the managed model, um, the foundry or the, or the marketplace will always give you a chance to actually try out your typeface, okay? That's something I recommend very, very highly, especially if you're putting down money or your client is putting down money for a typeface uh, or for a web font. Uh, make sure that you actually try it out. So this is, uh, I think, uh, Font Shop. They have a very nice UI for letting you test out, you know, your web fonts. So here you can see, you can try out different weights, different variants, different sizes. Uh, you know, you can change your alignment, you can change your line height, thickness. So you can really test and see, does this work at body sizes? Does this work at display sizes? Right? Is it a good fit for my site? Uh, you know, before you, you know, put down money for it. Um, that's something I highly recommend. So don't look at, uh, you know, just the renders that you see on the, on the foundry websites. You know, those are not created, you know, on the web. Those are created in design tools. So actually test it out. And I just want to end with uh, one last slide with practical kind of costing. Uh, uh, 
so again, this is taken from my own experience using some of these uh, fonts. Uh, I found this one typeface called Soleil uh, from Type Together, uh, which I actually found they sell on three different you know places with three different models, right? All the three that we just talked about. Uh, Type Together actually sells you know uh, this family on three different places. So I just considered two weights, the book and the board weight. Um, and this would probably give you a sense of how much to expect in terms of costing, right? If you're looking at paid fonts. Uh, so first of all, you know, Type Together sells Soleil on their own website uh, under a perpetual model, okay? So what does that mean? It means that you can pay 7,000 Indian rupees one time. Uh, they give you a perpetual license to Soleil, which means it's yours to keep forever, but you are limited to 10,000 uh, visitors a month on your website. Okay, so that's it. 7,000 uh, rupees one time, but you're, but you're limited to 10,000 visitors a month. So the moment your site, you know, consistently exceeds like, you know, 12,000 or 15,000, you have to go back to them and, and renegotiate a, you know, a license with them. Um, the same two weights, book and board of Soleil, type together sell on my fonts under a pay-as-you-go model. So that's a bit different. So how does that work? Pay as you go is literally, you pay 6,800 on my phones, but they don't care how much traffic your site gets. Here you pay for 250,000 page views in total. Okay, so the difference is here you're paying for 10,000 views a month, here you're paying for 250,000 in total. Okay, so uh, the pay as you go model is actually better for low traffic sites or new sites. Okay, so consider you're doing a, a brand new website for a client, like uh, it's a new domain name, it's a new website. You have no idea of how much traffic you're going to get. Uh, go with the pay as you go model. Okay, so the first month you may get like 5,000 page views, second month 10,000, third month 15,000. Uh, it will still take you many months to hit 250,000. By that time, you will have a fair sense of what is the average traffic that my website gets. And then you can probably go in for a perpetual license, which makes more sense, you know, in the long run. Okay, it, it, the perpetual one is built for steady traffic sites in which you have a good idea of, of what is my average traffic every month. Uh, compared to these two, you have the subscription model, uh, which is what the one I use currently with, with Adobe fonts. So the good part of this is that you don't just get Soleil book and board, you get thousands of other, of other typefaces as part of a library, like literally thousands more. Uh, they again, do not care about your page views, it's unmetered. Um, but the only thing is that it's a recurring cost. So I pay something like 4,800 every year. You can also pay it on a monthly basis. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's good for personal sites. It's good for hobbyists like who I'm always tinkering with, you know, the web fonts on my projects and on my sites. So it makes a lot more sense for me, uh, but this is a recurring cost. So, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, you are probably the best judge of, you know, what your particular project gets in terms of traffic uh, you know, and other requirements, but these are just the three model, you know, models that you can use. And this is how they kind of, uh, you know, differ in terms of cost. So depending on your traffic, depending on what you're using it for, you know, you can make a decision.